Hello and welcome everyone to episode 9 of Talking Shop with Tony Abbey. My name is David Quinn, Chief Marketing Officer at NAFEMS, and I'll be your host for today. This series is a part of our wider community programme of online events that we're delighted to be bringing you. You can see more details on both our websites, nafems.org and FE Training, and hopefully find something else of interest as well. This week, Tony's looking at stress concentrations and stress singularities. We'll kick off with a 30-minute presentation, then open things up to your questions and comments. So, without further ado, I will hand you over to Tony. Thank you very much, David, and welcome everybody to session nine. And as uh, David has said, the title is Stress Concentrations and Stress Singularities. Do we care? Well, well, we do. I always like to put a little bit of a teaser there in the uh, um, in the title. So. Um, are the stresses real or imagined in an FE analysis? And in some cases, the stress levels that we predict from FEA are not actually physically meaningful. And we're basically talking about singularities there. So the stress distribution and the high levels of stress locally, sometimes we, when we're trying to explain this in a report, we just say it's like an FEA artifact. In other words, it's kind of an artificial thing. It's not, not really there. And it can be very distracting and, in fact, sometimes quite confusing. So some of the most common examples where this can happen are the most obvious ones in this list. If we apply a point load, and I've got an example coming up, then we, we generate what's called a, a, a singularity. I'll explain how and what that is. Um, and the other one I'm going to look at is sharp re-entering corners. If we, for example, don't put a fillet into uh, a CAD model, we, we leave it out for some reason, it's a very sharp corner that generates a singularity. Some of the others which aren't quite so obvious though, uh, if we've got um, an abrupt transition in a local loading. So for example, if I've got a plate and I just apply a pressure distribution in the center of the plate, where that pressure distribution stops, it kind of runs out. There is actually a milder singularity at that particular run out. The same would be true uh, in a constraint as well. So if we stop the constraint, in fact, that's a harsher and more powerful uh, singularity. If we're constraining over say a region of a plate in the center and then we stop the constraint hard then again we get this singularity and constraining basically is like the um, um, reciprocal of the, of the of the loading except the constraint tends to be a harsher and more powerful singularity the reason is that um, if we think of a constraint um, in FEA a constraint is an infinite stiffness so at one point in the model we've got an infinite stiffness right adjacent to that we've suddenly got the natural flexibility that the element is representing. So we get that abrupt transition. In real life, there's going to be some um, edge effect, some sort of transition, and we, we will never get that binary kind of situation. So it, it's that artificialness which is creating these, these singularities. So some of them are a little bit more surprising, such as, um, for example, running out of a loading, abrupt transitions in local constraints. But sometimes the constraint itself can kind of sneak up on us. I haven't actually put the image on the, the course today, but um, for example, if we um, apply a load uh, axially, say on, a, on a, just a rectangular plate, and then um, the, the end, we, we have a distributed load going in, but at the end of the plate, if we actually, um, um, sorry, just gonna start my, my stopwatch here. If we, um, if we, if we um, constrain the end fully, we lock out the effect, uh, the, the ability for that end to shrink under Poisson's ratio effect. So the two corner nodes laterally, if we're, pl uh, if we're applying the load on horizontally, um, they actually will become point constraints. So they will actually generate singularities. So that's one that often catches people out because it's not, we don't think of the constraint as we're not applying constraint at a point, but the way it works out the load transfer at their reaction point is just through a point. So there's odd, odd things like that can happen. Um, another one is the abrupt transition between materials. If I actually model two materials um, and put them together, I'm going to get a singularity uh, in the stresses there. And if I mesh all the way down to try and trap and look at the stress variation across that transition, again, we'll see that, um, that singularity may, may occur. And again, it might be a less powerful one. Again, in nature, there's some interstitial or there's some transition, there's some fusion between the two materials. There'll never be a binary uh, transition um, at um, the kind of microscopic level. And it's this difference between um, the 
um, as it were, the um, um, the real life and and what it is we're trying to model. And it's not always obvious that we are kind of modeling things uh, wrongly there, if you like. So the first example is applying a point load. So I've taken this um, rectangular plate here. It's 10 by 10 by a quarter of an inch, just to give it some sense of dimensions. I'm putting a load right in the middle, uh, and it's actually a 1,000 pound force being applied in the middle. So this is a very, very coarse mesh. It's just a six by six mesh. I switched off um, uh, element averaging and um, stress averaging. You can see the each element is working its socks off to try and get a stress distribution using its own internal shape function, having got the uh, displacement field mapped to it, like this element here picks up the nodal contributions for displacement and then tries to fit shape function through that and the corresponding, or oh, it's got the shape function, it then tries to back fit its local stress variation. So you can see it's um, a very peaky kind of result. We're getting 13506 PSI, the von Mises stress at the center there, and a particular deflection. So if I could kind of play games with this and I just uh, increase the mesh refinement, naturally the stresses are going to be smoothing out. Again, I've switched off stress averaging. I put contour lines on so we can see that event effect. So we've got sort of two things going on. We've got the natural mesh refinement. Um, and probably by the time we get to this picture here, bottom left, we're getting a reasonable stress distribution. But if we look at that local region of stress, it's just going up and up and up. So there's 22,000, just about 29,000, 36, 43. So yes, the stress is getting smoother in general, but that point in there is what we're calling that, that is the stress singularity. And I think we've got a final um, picture here, and then we end up with a, a very, very fine mesh indeed. So the, the uh, unaveraged stresses are now, now looking very smooth throughout. And then finally get to this point in here. So we've gone all the way up um, to, let's see, where did we start off with? We started off with stress, which for this one was about 13,000. So we just increased that stress level at that center point up to 57,000. So that's um, getting on for four times the, the level of stress just by refining the mesh. So anything which is mesh dependent, uh, stress which is mesh, mesh dependent, doesn't make any sense. Yes, if we're converging, we converge to value, but we're not converging to value. And if we keep on increasing that mesh fidelity, then that stress is just going to keep going up and up and up. So it's never bounded. It's not what we call a, a stress concentration, which is a genuine uh, region of, of high stress, which we can converge to. It's a singularity, meaning that uh, mathematically, it's just going to blow up. If you think of a singularity as being like um, uh, we've got a function, we've got a singularity in that function, it means we've got essentially like a divide by zero. It's going off to, to infinity at some point. So that's exactly what we're, we're kind of seeing here. Um, the rest of the stresses look OK. But if I look at that point, then in fact, I've just highlighted the deflections because the deflections are starting to go up as well. It's stabilized, and we should be converging to uh, a, a deflection. Uh, stiffness, uh, stiffnesses should be converging. But here, what's happening is that little local element in there, and I've really zoomed in tight in there, it started to distort very heavily locally. So um, the local uh, displacement distortions are beginning to dominate as well. So we've got another issue coming through from the singularity. Um, now, right at that very fine mesh in there, the element width is 0 0.0223 of an inch. So the element area is a very, very small element area. And we can think of it as being um, the pressure applied or the force applied to that element. Um, the initial element is very big, um, and the, the, the load is going to be distributed amongst the surrounding elements. By the time it gets to here, the load is really, really focused, very, very concentrated. So it's becoming something which is kind of rather un, uh, kind of an unnatural sort of element uh, or loading. And I wanted to kind of relate it to what could we be loading it with. Well, here's um, a thing I found on the net, and it's actually looking at diameters, the matchstick, hypodermic needle, sewing needle, and then an acupuncture needle. And this actually came from an article on acupuncture. It's just saying that this is why acupuncture doesn't hurt, because that needle is so fine. The stress intensity there is so big that it basically just kind of cleaves its way it's rather horrible this time of the morning think about it. it. cleaves its way through the flesh without actually causing, it doesn't hit too many nerve endings, that's the thing, what they're saying. Whereas a sewing needle is going to hit four times as many nerve endings. So basically, our element 
It's smaller than the sewing needle, but it's about three times an acupuncture needle. So we are stabbing in with that kind of point in there. Um, and so that's the type of loading intensity that we're putting in there. And I've got a thousand pounds force. So if I divide by that local area of that element, the equivalent local pressure is somewhere around about two and a half million PSI, which is obviously um, a, a nonsense kind of intensity and nonsense sort of value. We, we, we just can't get um, that kind of intensity practically. Um, now, the thin shell element can't carry through thickness stresses. So uh, those pressures that I see directly in the FEA results that I, that I quoted, we don't see them directly in the FEA results. Um, if it was a solid element, um, then we, we would see the through thickness um, uh, stresses. So the, what's happening here is we're getting a very intensive local pressure, which is putting um, a, a local bending stress on the center, center element. So what we're seeing is actually the von Mises, uh, I think I use the top surface stress there. So it's essentially the bending due to that intensive, uh, very local pressure. Um, so in many ways, it's actually the, these, the local stress is probably going to get higher than that. It's still showing, showing the same kind of effect. Now, if this loading was considered to be realistic like a needle, then we'd actually need a 3D element with a nonlinear material failure mode so we can actually cleave our way through it. Um, I sometimes see um, a shell element described and the stress, um, the singularity stress being related directly to that force. Well, it isn't here. It's just uh, because uh, we can't, you know, it's, it's a secondary um, bending stress which is being developed. So it's not quite equal to the force per unit area being applied. Um, if we look at actual needle, um, it, the needle in our model is like Superman material and we just penetrate the steel. So I'm saying it's a Superman material because basically we keep that force going on and there's no blunting, there's no um, failure of the applied um, needle because we're not modeling it, we're just, we're just modeling the actual action of, of the needle in there. So it's basically, it, it's uh, some, like a Superman material, it's got Young's modulus, hardness and so on, which are uh, infinite if you like, so it'll penetrate through the steel. But what's interesting is this electron microscope with the tip of a needle, you can see it's actually not sharp in nature. Um, earlier last year I had a happy hour um, actually in an electron microscope um, a laboratory and we were looking at all sorts of things under the electron microscope and uh, we actually looked at a needle this isn't the shot from that you can see it is blunt so even if we were to try and model this uh, say as a nonlinear analysis we should put um, uh, a bluntness on an object or put a small circular patch in which represents the contact region and apply a pressure to that so our FEA model what it's doing is to say well I'm going to ignore the, the real life um, situation, which is always, always a blunting kind of effect. Um, so there's always a limiting stress intensity. The FEA needle, um, if you like, is a point load. So this is infinitely sharp. So electron microscope would see this at, let's say, a mild setting. Now all the, we go all the way down to the molecular level, and this, this sharp needle is still there. So this is the reason for the, the kind of singularity. We're just not modeling. Um, the real real world in, in any way and obviously we're going to get uh, plasticity coming in as well the stresses I'm reporting are, are kind of way through through plasticity so um, and we'll pick that point up a little bit later on so if I really wanted to do this job I would need to have a nonlinear elastic plastic model I would put either a pressure pad in there or I would actually put an object in uh, and actually try and uh, apply that load now, I need an extraordinarily fine mesh to get down to that level of detail in there. So taking up that idea, what I've said is um, I put a range of punches in. So the punch would be like the head of the, um, of, of, the, um, of the needle. What I've done now is to replace the point load by a distributed pressure load. So if I have a punch diameter of 0.667 inches, it's a little bit arbitrary. That's just about the zone inside here. You can see the circular zone in here. So it's still a very local um, pressure being applied but now is because it's a pressure I have sufficient elements in here and it's not a singularity so the total force is still a thousand pound force but the stress now converges to about 27,000 psi and if that's below um, yield then it would be a reasonable linear kind of analysis there so I've gone from a singularity where it's not going to converge because I'm just stabbing this point force in the center 
Um, the same force distributed over a small pressure footprint will actually give me a converged value. And that's the key to one of the fix-ups or one of the palliatives to overcome um, the idea of a point load is to actually spread the load out rather than actually accept a point load. Let's, let's, um, let's spread that out there. Um, so that was one punch. And then actually increase the punch down a little bit more. You can see actually now very nice concentric stresses in here. Bear in mind, again, these are, and these are uh, top surface bending stresses coming from the, um, um, the bending action underneath that, uh, that punch load. So they are not through thickness stresses. They're not got a contact stresses. So again, the stress converges to uh, a new value. And um, uh, I've got such a fine mesh in here, it's just converged directly to that. There's no kind of issue. So, um, uh, and you can see I've put a slightly coarser mesh in here just to, to speed the model up. But around in here, we're getting a very nice kind of stress pattern. So the, the question would always be, well, what is it we're trying to model? If we're trying to model a needle, then um, it's going to be a very small diameter. Um, uh, we'd, we'd have to put uh, a pressure patch on. Um, we'd have to have a refined mesh to achieve that. But we could get converged stresses at that point. Trying to just put a stab load in there, a singularity, uh, just plain, um, isn't, isn't going to work in that particular case. So here's another example. It's a, sh a shoulder, and there's a traditional kind of shape in here. And what I've done is to model this with quarter symmetry, and I've just taken the fillet out. Normally, you have a fillet in here, and you can see how I've meshed. I've prepared the geometry, and then actually put, uh, you'll see we'll, a little bit later on, we mesh it. But for the moment, I'm putting a right angle corner in. So on my list, this is another typical um, thing which is going to spawn a singularity. So what stress will be calculated in that? right in the corner there. And indeed, is the, is the stress realistic? Um, this pa uh, plot shows, um, first off, the contour plot is showing you've got a peak stress in there. And right in there, there's a little red blip, which is sitting at about 100,450 PSI. So that's a very localized peak stress. This is a graph showing the distance running from this free edge down in here up towards the top edge. This is a five inch wide um, nominal section. You can see that the stress is basically um, what we call a nominal or average stress in here, and then peaking up, coming up very fast with a very high stress gradient in here as it runs in towards that point. Now, if we put a real feature in there, we're going to get an increased stress, but that will become a stress concentration as we a little bit later on. This is basically, we're going to see very shortly, is mesh dependent. The average stress in here is 31,000. Um, and we can just basically take the force over area, and that gives us what's called a nominal stress. The nominal stress is the stress flowing through the net section without the influence of the stress raiser right in here. So if we do that simple calculation, the average stress is 31,000. Now, KT is a stress concentration factor. Either KT or SCF would be the typical kind of abbreviation. And it's the ratio of the peak stress to nominal stress. And that gives us a stress concentration factor of about 3. Well, that's not kind of outrageous, if you like, as a stress concentration factor. In general, we've got a plate, um, infinite plate with a hole in it. We get a stress concentration factor theoretically of three. So it doesn't seem perhaps too bad. But is it really representing the stress in that point? And the trouble is, it isn't. It, it it's becomes, we really don't know what the stress level is locally at that particular point. Notice the the, um, the the steepness of that curve there. That's what we're going to be calling the power of the singularity, and I'm going to refer to that in a slide or two. So now I've, I've done a, a survey, and I've looked at the number of elements along the edge uh, parametrically. So this is the number of elements which are running uh, along this edge in, in here, the, the, the free upstanding edge in there. And I've plotted the peak stress against that. Now, I've plotted the elements along the edge on a log scale, and I've looked at the peak stress in here. If I go to 60 elements along there, then I've got 220,000. So now I've got a KT value of 6.61. Obviously, that's getting silly because now um, that is an extraordinarily high stress, uh, stress concentration factor. That would be, if it was a real feature, it would be a very, very deep notch indeed that was giving us that kind of uh, that value. There's absolutely no sign of convergence. We're not converging to a particular value of stress in here. So it's clearly 
is an infinite um, infinite stress. If I, I keep refining the mesh, that just goes up and up and up. So it is basically, again, a singularity. And the problem is I can't say what the stress is going to be at that particular local region. Um, I've done it here. I've gone and messed There we go. I hit the wrong, wrong term. There we go. So it's a warning sign that FEA model is not physically meaningful. Um, we, we've got, if we've got a real feature in an FEA model, it should always converge to a stress level. Now, it might be a challenge to get that convergence occurring, particularly if it's a very sharp radius, uh, a very small radius, I should say. But it, nevertheless, we should get um, a, a converged value. So we stumbled into this stress singularity. Now, we can do classical field equations. They're, they're pretty nasty equations, but they basically look at um, essentially like an algae of potential flow. And if we've got um, a sharp corner, any one of these shown in here, you can actually derive the expression for the stress at that point. And it's usually a term, uh, a 1 over uh, a radius, and then the radius is getting infinitely small. So 1 over eventually 0 will give us that, uh, that singularity. Uh, the power of the singularity depends on the included angle. We've got a 90 degrees, which is kind of like middle, middle ground. You saw the rate at which that, that stress increased. If we go to a shallower angle, this is still a stress singularity, um, but the, um, the rate of increase, the gradient, if you like, is not quite so steep. As we go towards this, it's getting more towards a crack, then basically that, that power, that steepness is going to increase. If we all go all the way to an actual modeling a crack feature, which we do in lin linear elastic fracture mechanics, then we get a very, very strong singularity at that point indeed, at that point there. In fact, just as an aside, linear elastic fracture mechanics, we kind of dodge the issue and using a fracture mechanics approach, we don't use the stress at that point. We either use um, a strain energy release rate or we actually do an integration around in a zone around in here. So basically we've got, uh, and mathematically you can show what that, that singularity is and there are quite a few references which actually give you uh, an expression for that um, for that, that power, or like that exponential rise in, in stress. So basically, um, if we defeature that fillet radius, we removed any possibility to get an accurate prediction of what the stress should be. These are the um, uh, some of the plots in here. This is a coarse plot, um, a mesh rather, just two elements deep, so we're about here. Go on the way up to a very fine level here. I've kept the, I've kept the uh, legend the same. So this is the stress razor here. You can see the stress is, is basically um, starts low and then rises. And this is one of the problems we have is that if we um, do defeature, there's a very good chance the stress is going to be below. Um, uh, uh, sorry, we do a coarse mesh in here uh, with defeature. So with a coarse mesh, we might be below the actual stress that we're, we're actually predicting. And that's, that's one of the issues. Um, is that the right stress? Um, or not. It, it, it's really very difficult to, to say that, and, and generally we wouldn't try and make that argument. So now as a contrast, what I've done is to actually model the fillet, and um, I've now got a one inch radius in here. I'm using quarter symmetry mesh as before, and I've, I'm increasing the mesh density. Now trying to keep a good shape when we do uh, a mesh convergence study is very important. So you can kind of see the lines I put in here imprinted on the geometry to guide the mesh round so that as that mesh gets finer and finer, um, the, the shape is remaining constant, it's remaining a good shape. As we start, if we just do a free meshing on this, we can reduce the element size, but then the local element in here can start to get distorted. And that distortion can actually uh, disturb the, the convergence study. So a good convergence study, we want to do that. It's a good practice in general, just because we've said we've got a very fine mesh in there, we need to have a close look at what element results in there. And it might be a heavily distorted element. So we've actually kind of undone the, um, the mesh convergence approach by putting a lot of elements in. They've got to be good quality right where we want that detail stress in there. So this is, um, I've labeled this, this is the red curve here. This is now the actual fillet in there, the one uh, inch fillet. You can see it's converging to the classical solution. We can get a classical solution, uh, 1.97, um, and basically we can actually, there's a, a closed form, uh, a short uh, truncated series expansion for that KT value, or we can look it up on a table. 
it's well known as a classical solution. There's also checks with um, photoelastic analysis. And these days also, ironically, checks with FE analysis. So that is like the known classical solution. We're converging to that. And uh, that number of elements, uh, which is, say, about six elements along the edge, we converge to the right solution. As we um, go beyond that, there's really no merit in getting a finer and finer mesh, go all the way up to 60 elements, then that's kind of like overkill. So a normal mesh conversion study is to say it is a feature. We're trying to get um, an efficient number of elements to, to reasonably describe that. Now, that's a whole uh, another argument in there, but that's essentially what's going on. Now, out of interest, what I've done is to lay, this is our, um, with the singularity, which is going onwards and upwards forever, and this is actually the convergence in here. So it's showing the difference between the two, the two approaches. Now I've um, basically um, I've used the number around the um, uh, the fillet there to give a broadly similar kind of uh, uh, basis for the x-axis along here. So uh, contrasting those two methods in there, this is showing the the mesh refinement. Here is the peak stress again. I keep the legend the same. So that's the target. We've got a very good um, stress value right in there. Um, and then you can see coarser mesh coming in here. So what would be uh, what would be looking for in terms of conversion, convergence? Well, um, there's all sorts of measures of convergence. We can actually produce a graph like I did. Uh, you can look at the, the change in stress across an individual element. There's quite a few measures of convergence. This is probably this plot in here is probably going to be a kind of reasonable um, um, uh, stress uh, converge study at that particular point. This is going to be better down in here. Now, the area of um, stress concentration is, is extremely localized. Um, here it's actually interesting. The actual region of the peak stress is migrating slightly. So as well as not as chasing the right value, converging to the right value, also want to converge to the, to the right position. Now, KT is predictable for many standard features. We can look at Rourke's formula for stress and strain, has a selection. Peterson, Peterson table of stress uh, concentrations has a, a much wider range. And in the old days before FEA, this is basically what we would use. There's also online apps, which, which are very nice and have for sort of these kind of canned solutions in here. So basically, um, we can either look up at a table like this. So this is the particular feature. It's a double-sided notch. Um, the a nominal area is is the width between these features in here, and that's quite an important. It's, the, it's described as W1. That's the nominal width. And to get the nominal stress, we uh, would take that width times the thickness, and we would uh, take the force divided by that area. We've done that little calculation in here. Um, that gives us the nominal stress in here, uh, 22, just over 22,000. And then looking up the graph in here, we can see that it's a bit awkward. We've got to look up at the root radius divided by that um, that um, nominal or that net section. And then uh, we've got to get a line of constant W2 over W1. So that's the integrate, that's the, the point in there. Now, a lot of these are, as I said, like a truncated series solution. So more accurate, if you like, or perhaps easier is if you can just, I haven't put the uh, series expression in here. But the little equation, you can actually put that into Excel. It might be easier to, to read off. Um, you can take a choice which one you want to do. Or FEA will find the peak stress directly. The irony of FEA is that it will find the peak stress. It doesn't know anything about a stress, uh, about a nominal stress. Now, there are ways we can estimate that, like I did before. But in the more general kind of shape, one of the issues we have, particularly for fatigue analysis, is that it's difficult to back out what the stress concentration factor is. But nevertheless, this is converging to a known value. That known value is well predicted. Now, there are issues about um, whether that's accurate or not. But again, I won't get into those on this on the course here. So why doesn't nature show this singularity? Um, I don't get an infinite stress in the real life. Well, one of the un uh, questions is always, well, to get a uh, one of the answers is always, I can get a 90 degree fillet if I use a 90 degree milling tool. Here's an electron microscope picture of the edge of a milling tool. You can see we've got a radius in here straight away. So and no matter how fine we think we can actually get a right angle in there, there's always going to be some, um, some tooling radius coming in there, so some arbitrary radius.
So we can either take a, an arbitrary radius, which we might have to figure out, or there's a defined radius. And usually for design purposes, to avoid stress concentrations, or rather to have stress concentrations, but to keep the stresses relatively low, we'd actually put in a defined radius, which will give us a generous uh, radius and a low stress concentration. So we're not modeling a singularity. Um, I always remember the old engineering drawings. There was an instruction in the uh, legend block in here would always be something like, certainly in the aircraft industry, all undefined fillet radius to be assumed to be like, for example, here, uh, an eighth of an inch. Um, that's going to depend on different um, uh, different um, industries and so on. And what it meant was if the draftsman forgot to, to leave off um, the fillet radius, don't assume it's a right angle. Um, you're going to assume some value in there. There's sometimes issues with CAD because, again, there should be a CAD description of what the default fillet radius should be. So maybe the CAD model doesn't have the fillet radius put in there, maybe intentionally because they, they don't want to bother to do that, or maybe it's just accidentally left off. We come ahead and mesh it, and then we, we get that sharp right angle. The old um, adage was always D feature, uh, get rid of them. Well, that's okay for external corners, but not for internal corners. Just a quick picture can resist this one of some old guys. Um, that actually predates me. Uh, looking at drawing boards. So we, we're always reminded, and I like that uh, that legend um, uh, reminder, that it, it kind of kept in your mind, everything is going to have a fillet radius in here. This is an old story. I couldn't resist it. So the idea is that somebody leaves a drawing overnight. They haven't put the fillet radius in. It's grabbed by the production uh, team. They go and actually try and make that particular bracket, and they see there's a right angle in there. So taking a scribing um, uh, knife or, or point, trying to scribe a 90-degree angle on there. Now, it's a very, very old story, and it probably was never true, but to try and get a 90-degree angle in there, you've got to work really hard. And you can imagine the, the horror of doing that. Uh, the fatigue life and the local stresses would be, again, very, very high. So we can't, um, nature doesn't show a singularity. It just doesn't want to develop that right angle core in there, rather like the sharp needle that we talked about before. And in practice, if the corner is very small, but not infinitely small, we've got a, a call out of a very, very small radius, then the local stresses might well exceed yield. So our linear analysis is going to go up in here, nominal times uh, stress concentration. But if we go past this point, we go yield, then we should have a, a nonlinear solution, and we should be uh, kind of moving up in here. So the local plasticity will relieve the stress concentration effect. But the effect of plasticity is to blunt stresses and we use that like in the Neuber notch calculation and so on um, so it's not going to be increasing so fast ironically the local strains are shooting up uh, much faster because they now have plastic strains so we need a nonlinear analysis to include strain hardening um, but if we're modeling a singularity is that a realistic stress for a singularity and the answer is no it, it all it does is it slows the growth of the singularity down so instead of a singularity going off here forever with mesh refinement the singularity is going to be more sluggish and go go along here. And if it's just a work hardening slope, then again, it will go along here forever. So it's it's increasing at a slower rate. And it will also have this uh, spurious plastic zone, which will also start to, to spread. So um, it, it didn't, again, if, if it is a singularity rather than stress concentration, there's not much merit in trying to model that as, uh, let's say, let's use uh, elastic plastic nonlinear analysis. Um, so does the stress concentration accuracy matter? We, we've spent some time talking about these. We want to try and get stress concentration, get it inaccurate. But does it really matter? Could we get away with just ignoring it? Well, limit, limit strength analysis on a ductile material, ironically, traditionally, like particularly in the aircraft industry, we'd use nominal stresses in hand calculations and reserve factors on margins of safety on limit load. And essentially, we used nominal stresses. We ignored the peak stresses. The justification was often that the peak stresses would yield and self-relieve. Um, now, sometimes that creates a bit of an issue. If I run um, an FE model, I will get local peak stresses. The traditional hand calculation will give me nominal stresses. Trying to reconcile those two could be, can actually be quite difficult. And I know many colleagues in the aircraft industry are actually <laughs> hand stressing in many ways was quite simple. It was like a cookbook type approach. Now I've got an FE analysis with a very high local stress. What do I do about it? Well, 
I, I think the best thing to do is to aim for reasonable accuracy in a stress convergence study, say, well, this is what the linear analysis is giving me, and then we decide what we're going to do with that stress level. So if we ignore to choose, uh, choose to ignore it, um, or we put some sort of form factor in or whatever we might do, but at least we're doing it on the basis of knowing what the FEA value is and the distribution is, rather than just saying, well, put a, a coarse mesh in there and let's not worry about it. Let, let's actually find out what that stress is and then decide what we're going to do with it. Now, that can be quite tricky to decide what to do with it, but nevertheless, a good basis. If it's a ductile material, then basically um, we want to, in the old days, hand calculations, they typically use form factors and other methods. We would take our normal stress calculations, factor them to ultimate by typically 1.5, which is a typical relationship between yield and ultimate. And then basically the, the factors in here in the hand calculation include form factors and other methods to say in on test, we don't get these high levels of stress. We're okay because test shows that we've got some margin in there. It might be plasticity, whatever it might be. So when we go into ultimate, Again, there would be um, a kind of a band-aid kind of approach. FE analysis there, we've got to use nonlinear analysis. We've got to look at the peak stresses. We've got a true nonlinear relationship. That reconciling, again, the traditional factors based on testing and experience with the hand calculation methods and the FEA methods, again, can be rather challenging. But if we're using FEA, we need a very fine mesh to track the growth of plasticity. And also, geometric nonlinear internal force redistribution is quite important, and I tend to want to put geometric nonlinear with plasticity because that can actually change the distribution quite a lot. Just local uh, internal force redirection, not um, uh, geometric changes in the in the overall uh, structure. So we need a good mesh convergence and linear analysis as the first stage to get that. So, uh, so I put here, if we've got um, basically going for ultimate strength, we've got we've essentially got to raise our game there. We've got to think about getting good convergence there. So does it matter in that particular case? Yes. If it's a brittle material, it certainly matters because there's no margin between yield and ultimate. My china cup hits the floor. It doesn't yield and moan and groan and then finally fracture when it goes to ultimate. It's just a fast fracture straight away. So peak stress of the stress concentration will di uh, dictate the final margin. So again, we do want to get stress concentrations uh, and accuracy there, again, raising our game. Fatigue analysis, again, very important to have very accurate peak stresses. We're going to use these directly in high cycle fatigue, convert them to equivalent strains in a low cycle fatigue calculation. And the fatigue life is very sensitive to the accuracy of the um, stress calculation. Um, pulling from, one, uh, from the um, fatigue course I do, you've got the shoulders loaded with fully reverse cyclic loading with stress amplitude of 65,000, which was the conversion, converged mesh, mesh value then uh, an accurate um, uh, estimate if we ignore environmental corrections which are very important but just looking at the the stress calculation there then we get 221,000 cycles if i put in a very coarse mesh then i actually get a lower peak stress uh, so 65,000 plays 57,000 the life suddenly goes to a million cycles somewhere in between it comes down to 315,000 so the difference between 221,000 cycles and a million, that's five times the life because I put a coarse mesh in. So basically, um, the fatigue line is very, very sensitive because of the log-log relationship on the SN curve. So again, um, this was the point I'm making here. Again, brittle material, fatigue analysis, got to raise our game and make sure we've got good stress uh, convergence uh, with the stress concentration. And, and singularities have no role and they shouldn't be uh, allowed in those uh, those areas. So what do we do about singularities? Well, spread the load. I talked about that. Imprint a shape onto your CAD model, the surface, and then basically apply a pressure to get back to the equivalent force. And I do that with anything that I apply. I try and avoid applying point loads. Um, if there's no obvious bearing area, then use a lower bound area, some estimate of what that area might be. We can use a spider element to transfer load to bolt edges and so on. This is um, a point load being applied here, like a reaction force passing between. Uh, this is a lap joint in here. And if I actually put the spider in, I get stresses which are not correct, <clears throat> but they're of the right order, and they will converge. If I just have a point load transfer across here, <coughs> excuse me, then the stresses are off to, to singularity. 
The other stress is going to be okay. It's very embarrassing when we drop these stresses in here. We've got to try and explain what they are. I've seen people, some people trying to hide them. That's not a good idea. You need to, to say what they are and then, then deal with them. <clears throat> Another approach is just to kind of argue them away. And this is a, um, an approach that is sometimes taken, to say that if we tune a D-featured model, so it's got just a right angle corner, at some point, that line there, the blue line, cross, crosses the right answer. So if I know how many elements it is, and then maybe two elements in, in here actually will give the right answer. Well, the trouble is um, that um, method is OK if you do an intensive um, um, survey to say, what is the actual crossover point in there once you know the real stress concentration? If it's a, gen, a general shape, not a known uh, favorite, like we had the, the right angle feature where we can get a stress concentration for there, then we've got to actually explore that for FEA. So by the time you've done the exploration, you might as well have put the real feature in. So um, the only time that we could do this is perhaps if we've got repetitive uh, components and we can use like a maybe a surrogate model. But I'm not, I'm not a great fan of that uh, method in there. Um, it's the one that has tended to be the implicit argument going on for, for many years. I don't buy into that approach, as I said. It takes a lot of data fitting to, to be sure that the de-featured matches the uh, actual feature uh, level there. Um, OK, thanks, Stefan. I'll pick up the question a little bit later. Um, so in general case, the actual stress convergence peak is unknown. There's not much an uh, alternative to doing a convergence study. Um, I kind of as one of the spin-offs of this is that one of the trends in commercial FEA meshes has been to increase the mesh density uh, just because we can we can do that because we've got more power in, in more powerful computers, if you like. So typically, maybe an early mesher had a default edge count of two, maybe sort of like 20 years ago. That same mesher, they gradually crept up. Now the default edge count is perhaps eight for the default meshing. So it means that the sharp corner of hours, instead of seeing a comfortable 65,000, which ironically was getting close to the right answer, now we see a higher value. So neither value has any merit. They're kind of arbitrary, but um, sometimes um, we get we we just get we get lucky. Um, in 10 years' time, a typical mesh uh, edge might be 32 count, which is going to give a hundred, gives us 175,000. So if we go to the default meshes now, very much finer, all of these stressing characters are going to really start to come through much much more strongly. Um, so it, it perhaps will make the need to, to have more accurate modeling more obvious as we see more spread, spear of stresses. So for, I think for some extent, we've had this kind of what I call serendipity effect or good luck effect for many years in that a poorly detailed thick feature, perhaps no, no, um, it's been defeatured. It's got an inadequate mesh. It's a poor mesh. Two wrongs kind of seem to make a right. We get the, about the right order. So I think we've actually um, fallen into that trap for many, many years. Now we're seeing finer meshes coming through by default. All meshless methods or a p-element type of technique will really show up these, uh, these limitations. So to some extent, we kind of got away with it. And it almost comes back to this kind of argument back in here, which is that we get away with it if that's our um, unbounded uh, value, we're defeatured, um, and we hit that value, then it's about right luckily. Um, but again, sometimes we get lucky, sometimes we don't get lucky. So there's real no merit, no basis on that. Now, using plasticity, as mentioned, that, that you know, again, what do we do about singularities? Some people do that. It, it just slows or blunts the singularity. It doesn't remove it. And the nonlinear stress level in plastic zone will be spurious. Nonlinear analysis is more expensive to do. And if you've got a strong singularity, that can actually cause problems with the nonlinear convergence. So I think it's better to just uh, acknowledge the singularity, say it's there. Uh, I haven't, uh, I, I've allowed that, I've defeatured, and then argue why it's, why it's not important. Nominal stresses are low. So I've got a nominal stress, um, and I've got a, a peak stress there. But the KT, even if I put KT in of say, 4, it's not going to increase it to a significant level. So it's a low stress region. Um, maybe I'm going to use a local detail analysis later to justify it, or, or maybe I show that um, with test or service experience, 
this type of feature has never given me a problem. So these could all be arguments I use to actually say, well, OK, um, trust me, I'm an engineer. There is a singularity there, but I don't think it's going to be an issue. So we always want to be honest and show it um, rather than try and sort of hide it or smother it in some way. Now, St. Venet's principle is very, very powerful. And again, from the first episode, um, we've got the idea here that we've um, got a local feature in here. And the idea is that the general stress state doesn't know about the local feature um, as we come through. There's like zone three knows the general stress in here. Zone two knows about that bracket, starts to be diffused or changed because of the bracket. Zone one gets changed because of the local direction and the uh, because of the local stress redirections because of that fillet in there. Uh, sorry, the weld in there. So here's two examples. I'm interested in the stress concentration right in that particular point in there. And uh, what I can do there is to say, this is the without the gusset or the bracket in there. This is with the gusset. And right in here, I'm picking up that stress razor right in there. Now, what I can do is to de-feature using the, the, um, the, the, the maritime authority type of approach, basically smooth the stresses through there. Uh, looking again at the, the nominal stresses here, I can just through, smooth through there, take out that local stress razor. That's a KT factor in there take that out and then say, OK, I can bring back KT from some known value. Um, I can actually do a local model. I can go and get um, um, perhaps some data for the stress concentration factors at, at welds, weld toes, things like that, whatever the, what the idea might be. So I'm kind of taking the spurious stress concentration factor here, which is uh, on its way to a singularity, out of the FEA model and putting back a known KT value in here. So that's another way. Uh, of dealing with it. Um, again, St. Venance, if the uh, applied load is far enough away, this is from the first um, couple of uh, screenshots from the first uh, talk we had. Here's the loading, uh, distributed loading we want to have, and that's our area of interest. I put a point loading in. Well, that stress region is undisturbed by the point loading. So in that particular case, um, that singularity, which is implied with the loading, we could argue it doesn't matter. We're going to focus on that region in there. So with an argument, with a discussion, then I can kind of argue away uh, the stress singularity there. So in conclusion, there's a very strong temptation to either de-feature or mesh poorly at geometric stress raises, apply point loads or constraints, and include those other forms of singularities we talked about. Um, many failure predictions do want accurate stresses with evidence of good conversion. So putting a singularity in is a bad idea. And on, we, instead, we actually want to have a stress concentration and show that that's um, being converged. Even in the case of ductile materials being assessed against limit loads, it's then useful to know what the stress peaks and distributions are. And even if we discount them later or we've got another argument, at least know what we've got, what's been given in there. So that's the um, <laughs> that's my. Um, presentation on um, uh, stress concentrations and singularities. So thank you very much for watching that. I've really run over time there, David. Um, so I'll tidy up the video. I'll curate the, uh, the Q&A, put that on uh, YouTube and on our websites. Next session is on July the 10th. We're going to talk about spider elements, um, these famous uh, elements, very, very versatile, very, very useful, uh, why rigid and, uh, and flexible types. Um, David, I've just realized I've just completely done your job. I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have handed on to you at this point. <laughs> so Absolutely fine by me. <laughs> I'll tell you what, do you want to introduce the next dynamics e-learning? I'll give you a bone. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely fine. I was sitting here quite enjoying myself. Uh, yep, as Tony says, uh, July 10th, the next session. Uh, he's also Tony also has his introduction to Dynamics FEA e-learning class, which is starting on the 2nd of July. So that's next week. Uh, registration is still very much open for that. You can find information on the NAFEMS or FE training websites if you fancy uh, taking that class. Uh, but yeah, we do have a number of uh, questions. Uh, hopefully you can see those on the right-hand side there, Tony. So Josh Thomas asked the question, what's an example of a non-abrupt transition between materials? Are all boundaries between materials abrupt? In real life, uh, if we think of some, so for example, two pieces of steel being glued together, let's say with superglue, superglue, it, it gets into the interstitial 
uh, voids, if you like, um, between the two surfaces. So at the uh, kind of microscopic level, there's actually a transition from steel to glue back to steel, but over a graded region. So it's not an ab as abrupt as we think. Um, anyway, I, any kind of I kind of bond material together. There's the bond line in there, which gives that kind of transition. Um, if I'm fusing things together using heat, for example, um, friction stirring type approach, there's a transition that's called a heat affected zone, and there's actually a transition material. So never in nature do we actually have this binary: is material A touches material B. Even with a bond line, uh, something like a superglue, there, there's something going on in there. And, and we, we miss that when we model the singularity. Uh, Noel uh, asked the question, would the gradient from the center to the edge help in evaluating the actual peak stress? This is um, an approach to often taken in fatigue analysis. Instead of actually, as I mentioned, one of the problems with uh, fatigue analysis using FEA, we're very much using KT as a factor, and we, we modify KT to get our notch uh, factor and so on. So knowing KT is very useful. But in FEA, um, because we don't know the peak, and we, we, well, we do know the peak, but we don't know the nominal, um, what can be used instead is that gradient. So there is a technique instead to look at the gradient uh, that runs in there, which can be pulled off FEA fairly easily. Young Sin asked the question, will contact element help at the point? Um, contact elements are very useful. I talked about like a punch load coming in. So the punch load is now modeling more realistically. But in fact, there will be a small singularity where the punch load runs out. So we've got infinitely stiff at one point and then um, another um, and then more flexible. If I'd actually modeled the punch load as, as, a, as an object, as, as an FEA mesh. Contact can help there because contact is actually softening that transition. So I've got a good contact uh, mesh underneath there. The, uh, the contact itself will soften off. A any rollout of an edge is going to have a reduction in stiffness. Um, I've tried in the past. I've actually put softer regions of material around the outer side to try and reduce that, that abrupt change there. But certainly contacts can help, and that, that would be certainly one idea. And, and Josh says, even with a punch pressure footprint, it would be a mild singularity where the pressure stops. Is that true? That's absolutely correct. But because it, it's a milder singularity, if we really got in there, meshed very, very finely, and actually looked at that transition, we would find it. But generally, there, the, the, the general kind of field stresses, even the local region, uh, are what we're interested in, rather than maybe the abrupt, very, very high local local stresses. But again, if we wanted to do that, uh, contact is a good idea. Um, maybe putting a round on the edge of the um, of the punch, so um, we don't have that abrupt geometric transition. All of those can help there. Ivor makes a comment. Uh, My main issue with stress concentration is to explain their occurrence and non-importance in most cases in FEA modeled welded shell items for welded tubular structures. Yeah, um, it, sometimes what I do um, is to say we've got a, either a, a concentration or a singularity. It, it is an approximation that we're modeling in FEA. And either have an argument, like generic arguments I've talked about, or sometimes um, I've got a couple of uh, internal reports which have studied some of these issues and showed the kind of thing that's going on. For example, the, the transition, the difference between the fillet um, the shoulder uh, featured and non-defeatured, and I actually find those little internal reports. I kind of say it is it is an artifact, and here's a little reference to show why that is the case. But I think uh, either you've always, and I think you probably agree with me. You've got to explain what's there. I've seen people kind of move the mesh picture around a little bit so we don't kind of see the concentration. There are actually FEA techniques which try and the solver tries to recognize as a, a singularity and then quietly removes the stresses in a singular region. I don't like that. I'd rather see them and have to explain what's going on rather than quietly uh, remove them. Alexandria says, do you use any rules of thumb when dealing with stresses near connections? For example, bolted joints modeling with rigid elements. I've not seen a consistent way of dealing with this. I, I usually use like, the St. Venance uh, theory which, or principle, which is basically one critical dimension if I move away, so if I got a, like a bolt diameter, maybe I would say, well, the field stresses, the general passing field stresses being developed 
um, about one diameter away from the bolt uh, are going to be reasonable. Anything inboard of that, I would be suspicious of that. Bolts, you've got to be careful there because, again, if we, if we use a linear analysis, we don't get gapping at the back. But it probably still uh, would be a reasonable kind of approach. With a bit more experience is then we can perhaps actually come up with a better better um, definition there. Uh, a comparison between a linear and a nonlinear uh, is very useful. And that's the kind of thing you just do it once. You get a supplementary report, and then you can reference that, uh, that in the case, in that each case. Ivor says, um, one way to, argue, uh, to make the argument the numerical source of stress concentration is, is to measure the relative structure of volume with a higher stress value. A very small and decreasing ratio of finer mesh, then I state the numerical issue may, may be ignored. Not always. Yes, th there's some, actually some equations where you can actually look at a stress convergence study and look at the, the change in stresses. And I've only just found that um, in the last couple of days. And using looking at that criteria, you can say whether it's going to be converging um, to a value and you haven't converged yet, it's not sufficient convergence, or it's not going to converge. So looking at successive values, you can certainly do that. And this is with um, a successive refinements. Um, Mentor, um, hi Tony, tips to detect mesh refinement divergence. Check integration point stresses for convergence recommended. On mice is stress or principal stress to be converged. I, I always switch off averaging so I can see what's going on. It, the problem with integration points is that um, you're getting hold of them, not all uh, stresses there, not all solvers allow that. What I do, for example, is if I've got um, a stress which is supposed to be a, um, a tangential stress, let's say running around a, a stress concentration feature, and it's a surface stress. Um, if I look at the von Mises stress, um, that it's a kind of a roundabout way of doing it. That, uh, sorry, the the, um, the Gauss point stress is going to be extrapolated to the nodal point. If the nodal point, the maximum principal stress, isn't running tangentially to the surface, that's a pretty clear indication that probably I've got lack of convergence because that principal angle is um, is not being extrapolated properly. And um, if the principal angle, say, gets much above, say, five degrees, that maximum, uh, maximum principal stress, instead of being tangential, has got some kind of kickoff angle, which is physically impossible. So that's one way of doing it. Um, I tend to use um, any of the stress quantities to, to look at um, uh, convergence. Again, there's lots of, of measures of convergence. Um, I would typically Maximum principal stresses is always a good value to look at, successive maximum principal stresses, um, but we could pretty well use any any stress in there. Mentor uh, asked the question, what are the checks when using reduced full integration and incompatible mode elements? It's really, we're just looking at what they produce. So um, we've got, um, they're attempting to model the stresses mathematically, uh, different shape functions, different approaches. But it's still essentially the same mesh convergence study that, we, that we'd be using there. Martin asks a question. I've got a question the welding, uh, to the welding problematic and singularities. I found in some theories that one type of modeling is to use uh, shell elements with sharp edges. In reality, it's realistic because like you uh, presented um, by the sharp edges causing the singularity, do exist for some recalculation which I could use for realistic stresses. Uh, I don't use direct solid elements because my geometry is too complicated and then will um, raise the, the computating computational time. I must admit, um, I don't quite get into that, but I sometimes for features, I actually prefer to use shell elements because if we've got in-plane results, they're giving us nominal stresses because they don't know about stress singularities, let's say through thickness, like a, like a weld toe. Um, solid elements are trying to model that um, that stress con concentration. Um, so sorry, I'm talking on swapping concentrations and singularities. We focus on concentrations. So a shell element is always giving us a no nominal result. It's taking the bending and axial forces, and then just using p over a and sigma equals m y over i. Give extreme fiber stresses. By definition, they're nominal, 
the solid element is going to pick up whatever stress concentration it finds. Um, we can use the hotspot method to de-feature the solid to get back to nominal. The advantage of the shell element sometimes is we're already at nominal, so that, that is one advantage using shell elements. Um, Andreas says, some B and PV design codes recommend to model a sharp angle but analyze the stresses only at a minimum distance equivalent to grain of the material, 0.05 millimeter for stainless steel. What do you think about this recommendation? Um, I think it ties up with what I was saying that um, in the old days we'd only use nominal stresses, so we wouldn't even be looking at um, the stress concentrations or the singularities. And I think this is a case where experience is showing that the um, if we look at that stress at a, a, a particular distance away from experience in these um, these industries of the certification uh, uh, covering those industries, it, it from test evidence operational experience, if we monitor the stresses there, then we don't get into trouble. And it might be because of um, local yielding or other alleviation. So it is, I think. Uh, what's happening there, Andreas, is an experience-based approach saying we don't need to model that, that uh, either the concentration or the singularity, so let's move away from that. So I think that, that kind of um, that goes into, the, um, into, the, into that argument there. Andreas also has a point here. It said that a sharp shoulder is not physical and that a radius should be introduced. However, if a shoulder is milled, if the material removed might in reality not be smooth even if the milling tool has a radius um, yes uh, that's true um, there we're using really a nominal radius um, uh, again it would come down to for most static uh, conditions that would probably be acceptable for fatigue um, again the stresses we would be pulling out but we would be looking at the surface finish effect and there's a knockdown factor for different types of machining so if it was a machining such as milling which was giving us a very poor local surface finish we're actually then putting a knockdown factor on the SN curve to, to take account of that so I think it comes back to my does it really matter or not in that particular case probably not for static where we're working for limit loads but for brittle materials and for fatigue for fatigue we would be putting that factor in for brittle materials, we might put an additional factor in to account for um, poor machine finish in a brittle surf in a brittle material. So there's a lot of engineering judgment kind of goes into this, rather than being too pedantic. And that's the point I was trying to make. We don't always be too pedantic about does this stress concentration factor or singularity really matter? I I think um, it, it does for brittle. It does for it does for um, for fatigue. Other cases, I think it doesn't matter so much. Uh, Robert makes the point, industries such as the aircraft industry have too many structural details to mesh all to convergence, where there is no standard KT factor. Is it common to develop specific KT for your geometries, thus work with nominal stress? Uh, stress? Thoughts on that? I, I, the jury's still out on that one, Robert. I've talked to a lot of aircraft stress men over the last sort of probably about the last 10 years, to get reconciliation between the old Brun type of hand calculation approaches. As I said, we would typically be using nominal there. And now we've got FE analysis and we're using, we see our peak stresses coming in. Is it common to develop, develop specific KT to your geometry, thus work with nominal stress? Kind of would be one approach. The difficulty is, is back backfitting from uh, FE analysis what the nominal stress is going to be. Um, in other words, what is the value of KT? We get the peak value out. I have in the past actually um, done exactly that. I've tried to estimate KT based on uh, like a stress uh, gradient, uh, stress um, XY plot running through, backfitted and try and estimate what the nominal stress is based on integration uh, of that area. And then um, look at the actual stress concentration factor implied in there and try and relate it if possible back to hand calculations. That's actually a pretty wide subject. Um, reconciling what we do with FEA when we get a stress concentration in the aircraft industry compared to the old ways is, is still, I still think people still struggle that with that. Zoran asked the question, 
What do you think about using and simulating double plates used in sharp corners of steel structures? I, in shipbuilding, it is used in large batch corners or rectangular windows. I can't quite visualize what, what you're saying there, Zoran. If you want to send me an email as a supplement, maybe with a sketch, I don't quite quite follow that. I, I, I understand doublers uh, around um, uh, sharp corners would be would be important in many used in many industries, but I'd still want to actually have the fundamental geometry there. So we've got a sharp corner. We, we're modeling that that actual geometric corner, and we've got a doubler plate behind it. That would be a typical kind of approach. I wouldn't want to defeature that that uh, that radius running around there. I think what, what we're running quite long time past. I think David, um, there's so many questions. I've got to say this is perhaps one of the most I've never seen quite so many questions come through. So I think yep. I'm going to um, uh, address these a little bit later. Maybe cherry pick some of them out. Maybe we can have a, even have a supplementary um, uh, uh, talking shop just addressing some of these questions and some of these issues. But um, uh, just to let everybody know, I do get the text of these, so I'll try and deal with that. So at that point, I think David, I kind of I'll call it quits. Um, I've got another e-learning class starting in about 45 minutes, so I mustn't overrun into that. So again, thanks very much, everybody. Really appreciate uh, the um, the questions and the feedback that's popped through. Uh, I've got to say that many people are now becoming very familiar, so a lot of uh, good uh, familiar faces there. So really appreciate those people that are are attending a lot of these. You know, um, some familiar comments and and uh, names cropping up. So with that, David, I'll hand over to you to to wrap up the session for us. Thanks very much, Tony. Yep, as as Tony says, a lot of questions today. We're, we're up in the in the 80s in terms of the questions that have come in. Uh, but you know, we have to let Tony go. Otherwise, I will start getting phone calls from our e-learning department. <laughs> <laughs> the Lazinskis will be shouting at me. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. It's been great to have you along. Uh, we do already have the registration page for the next Talking Shop, episode 10. That's now live on the NAFEM's website. So you can go there uh, after today's presentation, get yourself registered. Uh, and as we've said, Tony's next intro to Dynamics e-learning uh, starts on the 2nd of July next week. And there still, still are places available for that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I've been looking at setting up a merchandise store so we can all uh, come online with hoodies in the next few weeks. I hope you all uh, stay safe. Hope you all have a great week and hopefully see you in a couple of weeks' time. Goodbye for now. Bye, everybody. Thanks very much.